I'd like to uh, thank Rand for inviting me. Uh, fall somewhat outside of just the, the traditional marketing uh, realm when, when you uh, look at all the speakers here. So I think what you're going to find in this talk is you're going to find some interesting things that might push you in ways that you may not have thought of before. So how many people actually are responsible for doing some design work on their website? I know there's a, quite a few people out there that probably have to play multiple roles. OK, good. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to speak to a lot of uh, uh, things that you can take, and, and if you're a SEO specialist and, and really involved in, in pulling people into your site, then what this will do is, is give you more credibility at the table when discussing uh, the website and what you need to be doing on the site. So, all right, so let's get started. So, design that drives action. How many people know boo.com? Let's see, show of hands here. Boo.com, all right. Wow, okay, so only a few people. So, boo.com might be one of the most spectacular internet failures of all time. Boo.com could be boo.boo. .boo. Uh, I think back in 90, uh, 99 when I was uh, starting my career, this site was getting all kinds of publicity across fashion matters, magazines. Uh, it was actually uh, getting tons of links, lots of publicity before the site had even launched. So I think it had missed two or three launch dates and it'd be, it had been publicized numerous times. If you look at this, this is, this is what you got when you went to the website. It actually popped up a window, uh, made the, the screen size scale down, and presented you with a bunch of options. So it presented you with two things. Did you want simple mode or complicated mode? It created uncertainty. Their whole back end system was uh, tied to uh, some kind of uh, country code based thing. And so they had to ask you what your country was. Then they asked you what mode you should use. More questions. And then they added a huge flash file, which basically took about 30 seconds to load at the time. So on a 56K, I'd be loading this page every day, trying to figure out what their next move was, right? Superfluous design, unrelated content, poor use of form. So this particular example will go down in history as one of the most spectacular failures. $188 million in six months, right? Within four months of launching, they closed, right? So. If, if you can take away anything from this presentation is that design plays a huge factor in what people are doing. Again, the design itself wasn't the cause of their failures, but it was very systematic of a company that was overzealous, that wasn't paying attention to details, and threw design out the, the window. So when you looked at this, you say, well, that you know, looked like a clean design, but that's not design. That's, that's uh, window dressing. So when you start thinking about your websites and the, the clients you're working for, you really need to be thinking about what happens when they get to the site. What happens when I drive this user through a link to the site? And it can be the difference between millions of dollars and unhappy customers. There's three concepts that you need to take away from this talk, just three. They're broad concepts, but if you can understand these three principles, you're going to have a, a, a lot better time in trying to convert your users on your page. Visual design, content, and form elements. Right, so we're going to walk through these. I'm going to give you case studies and examples in each one of these so that you can pull away um, some, some practical advice that you can take to your team and try and figure out how to do this better. Uh, so again, as, as mentioned before, uh, Zerb, I'm Brian Schmieski. I've been doing this uh, since 98, so you can call me an old, uh, old dinosaur in this industry. Uh, you know, Part of the reason I got into this wasn't because I was trying to create lots of uh, uh, you know, money. It was because I was really interested in the web as a, as a, as a vehicle of engaging people and creating awesome products, right? So, you know, over the years, we've, we've really been able to, to work with uh, quite a few companies. You might have heard of some of these. Um, we've worked with over 150 startups and created over a billion dollars in exits. So, a lot of our advice is, has been tried, and we've worked with lots of companies. So, you know, these examples, uh, you know, have been tested. So, our mantra at Zurb is, is design for people. And when we talk about design for people is, you know, the internet's this amazing place and you can do all kinds of uh, incredible things, but if, if you forget about the people aspect of it, you really haven't done much of anything. It's a way to connect to people. And, and when we think about design and building great things and attracting customers, it's all about what the design is gonna do for the customer, not necessarily just the business, right? So it's balancing those business goals with the user needs. This presentation and what we're talking about, a lot of it has to do with surface level design, and that is great. It's very tactical, and you can do lots of things within your website to change uh, the metrics and drive conversion. 
Uh, but the reality is, is this is really a capital D thing. You know, when we're thinking about doing design work, we're not trying to build something that's gonna get someone through a door and then you know, on to the next thing. We're trying to build something that actually creates long lasting value. And I think Rand spoke to this earlier in his marketing um, pitch is that you can't just get people to the front door and expect that they're gonna really enjoy what you have to offer. You have to think about the whole stack from everything you're offering within a service or website um, to that you know, last click they have on an exit. So the interesting thing about this is there, there really isn't any formula. We can't actually give you a formula that you're gonna be able to go back to your team and say, well, this is how you do it. This is how design turns this uh, into an awesome conversion activity. But there are patterns, and the patterns are what you know, we're looking for, is ways to take these, these methods and, and processes and figure out how do you actually implement this stuff on a regular basis, as opposed to just guessing each time. So let's, let's, let's take a high level example and try and figure out you know, how we can create a framework for this and we'll get very specific examples here. So everyone sees two shapes here, right? We've got two, two outline shapes. Now what if you put some lines in there? Now the design is actually helping shape and create some context without doing anything other than adding some lines. Add three more lines and now your brain is actually trying to figure out what's going on. So, Again, how many people were thinking, oh, I can put that uh, little box in that stack of boxes right there? You know, all that's going on there is visuals that are helping communicate that something needs to happen. We haven't really communicated anything other than putting some visuals in. So let's, let's stick with this analogy. Content, content plays a huge role in actually driving people to form actions. If, if you're an SEO expert, obviously the content plays a huge factor in links and, and getting traffic, but once you get to a page, it really helps drive the action. So thinking back to that box, content design guides the decision. So in this case, we have a box and, and now we have a, a verb up there. It says insert. So now I've, I've taken something that was somewhat abstract and now it's become more concrete. I need to take that box and put it in that stack of boxes, right? Now we make it more of a call to action to say, oh, you gotta do this now, right? I, I need to do this, I'm compelled, right? <laughs> Now we add an incentive, right? So we add something there, and then now I'm more compelled, and I can win, right? And then you get a flash text there, right? Uh, right, now we have social proof there. SEO Moz did it, right? So now I'm more comfortable in putting the box in there. I can visualize what's happening here. So the content helps guide decisions in this. Right, the third part of this is form elements. So, you know, the, if the visual design is setting the context, and the, the content is really helping you drive the action, the form elements are what it allows it to happen. Right, so going back to our, our high level concept here, you know, we have a box, we're told to insert it. Right? The form elements tell us how to actually do it. So in this case, we're really directed through a form element that says, hey, you need to put this box in here. Right now we get some uh, you know, tricks and put a start button there that basically gets you thinking, well, wh what am I gonna do here? How is that gonna actually happen? And then you're given some mechanism of actually putting the box in there. So the form elements finalize those actions and, and really bring the, the content and the visual design full circle. How many people know what this is? Right, okay, so a few hands go up. Uh, this is a, Facebook's uh, main visual design element I'd say on the site. It's the, the cleanest, simplest example of taking these three concepts and playing it into one. So if we look at this, this is the, the front entry uh, point on Facebook. The little triangle there, it's actually 10 pixels. That little triangle tells you where you, what type of content you're going to upload, right? So it serves as a navigation element. The, what's on your mind is the content. It gives you a sense of what you're supposed to do. In this case, it's asking a question, so it's a directive as a question. And then there's a form element. So you can actually put a cursor in there and you can start typing something in. So all three of these play into a small space without actually adding much on the visual design without actually adding much on the content and the form is very minimal as well. So why is this stuff important? So I think you know, everyone would probably agree that you know, getting people to a page doesn't really uh, do much unless you can actually convert. But it, it's more than just conversion, it's, it's engagement, right? So if you're just running people through a treadmill and trying to get them through your funnel, you're not gonna be too successful long term because you haven't really engaged your customers. Right? So design is as much about setting up expectations when you're bringing them through a funnel as it is trying to engage them once they're in uh, your website, your app, or whatever service you're providing. Details matter. The reality is details matter. Go back to the boo.com case. You know, 
millions of dollars, lots of people running around building big infrastructure, and then they throw up a web page that basically puts huge barriers in front of people to actually get even into the site, right? Amazon.com at the time was probably laughing themselves uh, out loud because you know, Boo.com was trying to put too much of uh, a visual design component in front of users when really what they're trying to accomplish was purchase sports gear. The other thing with this is that you know, when you look at the internet and all the pieces that, that, that have been built over the time, it's really, there's a commodity, it's, it's become a commodity in the sense that you can get a website up for 100 bucks that can serve you know, thousands and thousands of people. You know, the web languages, the web frameworks, all of that has been basically commoditized. The design or trying to figure out how you interact with your customers is the part that's gonna help separate you uh, when you're driving people to a site. So let's, let's go through some examples. So I think this is good, it's high level, and, and actually getting the specific examples really helped. So let's go through this. We'll show some examples in each one of these categories. So uh, visual design. How many people know Tiny Pick? Anyone? Anyone familiar? So we, we helped uh, Tiny Pick uh, do a redesign. Um, Photo Bucket uh, actually owned Tiny Pick, and Alex uh, was the CEO. And he was just kind of a hacker guy. And Photobuck was, was, uh, had so much growth that they ran into problems with actually getting uh, the service running. So what he did was created a service overnight called Tiny Pick that allowed people just, without a login, just to upload an image directly from a link in a web, web page. Well, it was so successful that in its own right, I think it was a top 300 traffic website just by allowing people to upload an image and link it to other websites. Um, so in a site like that, to support that, you need ad revenue, right? So, you know, what we had done is is help them redesign and refocus, uh, you know, parts of the overall experience. But one of the things we did was the first page, the first thing you saw on the page was an ad in a form. And through some iteration and just trying to figure some stuff out, we put up lots of examples of, of ways to do this, and we tried out different things. One thing we tried out was a blue box to see what would happen, and we put the. The, the site up there. Does anyone uh, know if it, it actually changed the performance? How many people think it had no impact? Didn't have any impact? How many people think it had a negative impact? It actually affected the, uh, the click-throughs in a wrong way. How many people think it had a positive impact? Okay, good. We're gonna play this game here. So, it was so successful it increased the click-throughs from $2 to $5, right? So, and, and there's, some interesting components to this that, that help do this. So what the box did was it actually prevented ad volume. So it pulled the, the ad into the form and associated the visuals with the action. So if you're looking at a site, most people are used to actually dissociating the ad from the action they're taking. In this case, since the page was fairly clean, by putting a, just a thin blue box around the edge, it gave more context to the ad and people clicked on it. So Within a matter of uh, you know days, we were seeing huge performance out of this. So, if you have anything to take away from this talk, say we need a blue box behind that uh, ad, right? That'll make you a superstar. Um, the the real takeaway here is is association of uh, the content and knowing that by by pulling it in, it prevents ad blindness. So here's another example, and and again, all these examples aren't haven't been published before. So you're getting insights in here that haven't been shared. Photobucket accounts, uh, one of the things that Photobucket learned was, you know, Flickr was this upstart and they were actually driving lots of traffic and keeping people engaged. Photobucket, their whole mission was get a, a photo up online and link it somewhere else and go somewhere else. And they realized, well, we need more engagement. And this was before their sale to MySpace, which obviously the demise of that happened. Um, but the account increased, uh, trying to figure out ways to increase engagement was really important. So this is a classic example of uh, red button, green button, right? Simple, simple color change on a button. So as part of a redesign effort, the, the red button was turned to a green button. So how many people think the green button did not change the performance? Raise your hand if you think it actually didn't do anything. How many people think it actually improved click-throughs by putting a green button? All right, cool. Anyone want to tell me why? Green means go. Green means go. No. 3.5% to 2.5% loss of 7,000 daily registrations, right? 
Coincidentally, we didn't change the green button, their team did, so. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, green means go, right? But in a page, it's, it's all contextual, right? So the red button actually had more contrast in the page because it was a blue page, right? The green actually fits on the color wheel closer to the blue and it blends in. Now coincidentally, I tried to do some more research on this to figure out. It turns out like 6% of people are actually colorblind. So when you look at it, the contrast between the green and the blue isn't as great as the red to the blue. When you have that much traffic going to your, your web page, all these little factors play a, a role in this. So, so don't trust your intuition that green always means better. Red sometimes can, can play a good uh, uh, conversion tactic. So again, if you're looking for colors, there's no tried and true way of actually applying color and saying you can get better, better conversions. Um, you have to play and, and figure out what works with the, the overall design, capital D. So base kit, the base kit is actually a customer of ours. Uh, we actually sell products as well, so we're not just uh, an agency. So we, we learn a lot of this stuff through our actual tools, but this is provided through uh, Visual Website Optimizer. Uh, Basekip wanted to try and actually improve the, the click-throughs over to their buy page. And the pricing page here, they had, um, which in most accounts is a pretty good looking page, right? Very clean, and they thought they could do better. So what they tried to do was change up the page. And what they did is they put this page in place uh, to test it out to see what kind of uh, conversion bump to the buy page they would actually get. So, did the new page perform better? So which, which page do you think works better? The original, who thinks the original worked better? Okay, awesome, how many people think the new one performed better? Okay, so you got more people thinking the new one. Right, so the visits uh, to the buy page increased 25% with the new one, right? So. Why is that the case? I'm not gonna ask this one because there's lots of factors to this one. So, if we look at this page, the new example actually shows social proof at the top, which is always good if you have uh, a customer or someone that's recommending the service, it, it validates that you, what you're doing is right. Uh, the clear calls to action. So, in this particular example, we have a green button that gives you one point of contact to go. If you look at the, uh, the old design, it had multiple buttons to click on with different colors and it looked a little confusing. Here, green means go, in this case, you win and uh, you get to go on to the next page. So the, the clear call to action. And get started isn't as, is, uh, um, it's a little bit more passive, so people feel like they can get to the next page without over committing. And then if you look at the, the bullets at the top, there's a simple uh, comparison. So if, if I'm a user and I'm trying to figure out what the difference is between the, the prices, now in this particular design, they're all simplified so that I can quickly see the difference between each plan and I can make an educated decision. If you go back to the, uh, the other one, there was a long list up front that wasn't quite as clear. Here they're aligned better so that each one of those uh, proof points sticks out as a bullet. There's other things describing the service above. Okay, so let's go on to some content examples. Content is a great way for most uh, marketers to change things because it doesn't require having any specialized skills to, to manipulate a web page. Anyone can change content on a page. <clears throat> so here's an example. This is our actual product, Notable Screenshots. Uh, Notable allows you to, to uh, capture screenshots from a web page or upload images into the browser and then annotate them. So what we were trying to figure out is how do you make the on-ramp experience better for people that don't know anything about the service. So, we, what we did was we ran a uh, multivariable test in Verify, another product of ours, to figure out if we could actually improve uh, the site. So in this site, we have new capture at the top, and what we tried to do is change the language to new post to figure out if that would increase the amount of screenshots or images uploaded into this, the site. What we found was the more images that are in the site, the more engagement there is and more people are willing to pay for the service. So it was a very important uh, concept. So, by changing the word uh, to new post, did it have any impact on the click? So how many people think it actually decreased the number of clicks? Raise your hand. How many people think it increased the number of clicks? Okay, you guys are getting better at this. So, verified clicks on the new post were 25% higher. And if we actually look at this, the reason for that is the vocabulary fits the mental model. When we first started the site, the site was very focused around screenshots and browsers, and what we realized is the behavior of the users changed over time, and the number of uploaded images significantly were increasing. So when you start thinking about a capture, 
you're not thinking about an uploaded image. So when someone's mental model of coming to this page, they're not thinking about trying to capture something. They already have the capture. They're trying to upload it. So by changing the vocabulary, it actually fits what the user is trying to accomplish. So when you're thinking about your marketing campaigns, especially on new services where you're evolving like every month there's something new and you're changing it, you constantly have to keep evaluating this stuff because the way someone perceives your service changes over time based on what types of activities they're using it for. Again, here's another uh, great example of content with TinyPix. So again, when traffic flattens, you have to keep figuring out how do you get that next boost of traffic. So TinyPix realized that uh, they took a, a page out of photo bucket and said, well, we, we need more engagement with our uh, site to get people coming back and using it. It increases the ad dollars. So we tried lots of different things with the site. And here's an example of an upload page that allows someone to just come in and upload a page. Uh, we thought, well, let's try and figure out if we can actually get um, more account signups by putting in a little thing here that <coughs> basically cookied their machine with the last three images they uploaded without having any account registration. So we were trying to figure out if we could get people to register. So did inserting these three images increase the engagement? How many people think it had a negative effect? Anyone? Disrupt the flow? Anyone think it had a positive effect? OK, positive. Sign up registrations jumped 30% in the first month, 30%, which is actually incredible. And why, why is this the case? Well, if we look at what we're actually uh, doing here is, is we're disrupting the user with content that's there. So when you're trying to grab someone and get someone's attention, what better way to do it with, than with something they've actually done? Now, granted, these are images that uh, they copied from uh, you know, Batman. But they remember putting that into the system. And then when you look at that, you quickly read your last three uploads, don't lose them, sign up. It's a directive, and, and what people were doing was actually signing up because they didn't want to lose those images. All right, bag check referral dollars. So we needed to increase uh, uh, revenue. Luke W is a, a good friend of mine, and he has this site. Uh, if you look at this particular example, they were looking for any way to, to increase revenue. So what they did was uh, inserted a little thing here on Amazon. When Amazon was running a sale on items, they actually inserted that into the page with little gray text. So did inserting light gray discount change referral dollars? Anyone think it had no effect? Just little things. Yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> referral dollars increased 50% by putting in a little gray little line there. And why? Because it's contextual. If someone's actually reading and trying to understand if they want to buy something or they understand that there's something for sale, giving a discount is always going to help. It's relevant. So it's, it's not just trying to throw you into another direction. It's very specific to the actual um, product that's being presented. And it's action oriented. So I think the text actually says, now 51% off. So the implication there is you're supposed to follow through with that action. So by disrupting the flow with something that's relevant to, potentially relevant to a user, you're going to get more actions on it. All right, so let's go on to form elements. Bling at sales. So Bling at, we were actually helping on a software product. Bling at allows you to actually isolate images and then put a background images. It's been proven that if you do this, you can increase your eBay sales by 20%. They ran lots of tests on this. So, you know, that's where you get the uh, uh, crazy images in the background. And you're like, why would anyone do that? But apparently, it creates uh, more sales with your, you know, cameras. He came in and he said, I'm not happy with the sales of this tool. And we were working on the software app. And so we talked about it. And he said, well, you know, if I can just get people to use this thing, they get it really excited. And so if you look at the page, I said, OK, well, you know, what do you got going on here? You have a free trial. They can download it. They can buy right off the page. If you looked at their home page, I was like, well, you can't, you can't do any free trial here off the home page. You have it on the product page. He's like, yeah, I didn't want to get in the way of people coming back to make a purchase. And I said, yeah, that makes total sense. Let's try this. So we added a free trial button. So how many people think adding the free trial actually increased sales? All right. How many think it actually detracted from the sales because it got in the way? OK, you're wrong too. 100%-ish <laughs> more downloads and an increase in sales. So I couldn't get exact numbers out of him, but he came in elated the next week. Right? And why is that the case? Well, it was so successful that they, they thought they'd take it to another level. I put a huge button right on top of it, right? So uh, he's like, yeah, I got to get more downloads here, right? So 
So what it did was it, it basically removed barriers for the user. The user wanted to use the tool, not listen to the marketing message. So it gave those users an easy way to download the tool. Um, and it promoted action. So basically, you removed the barriers to a product that was actually solving a problem, so getting out of the way of, of trying to market it. So photo bucket printing, this is a great one. Referral dollars for each print. So photo bucket business was in selling ads, but they also got referral dollars from getting photos printed. So this is uh, the thinking here is uh, Coop was actually providing the services to them. The screen is somewhat complicated here. There's lots of going on, but your pictures could be uploaded and you could present, print from them. Uh, so what we, we the, the, the team thought about was, what if we actually work with a bigger brand that's more recognized and we simplify this? So here this screen is. You can see the pictures are much bigger. It's more focused. And uh, it's easier to, to see what you're purchasing. So did the new page increase revenue? How many people think the simplified page uh, increased revenue? All right, how many people think it decreased revenue? OK. Monthly revenue dropped 90%, right? 90%. To any business, that's, that's a huge slap in the face, right? So, of course, Cardiac has a great brand, but there's some obvious problems with this, and there's numerous problems. But the biggest one was, if you look at this, we're putting form elements in front of each photo. So you had to manually select this. Now, there was a select all link at the top, but when you looked at this, I'm now, the psychology is, is now reversed. I am now in an editing process of removing something. Coop, and, and you might not have noticed it, they just put the whole album in. So all I had to do was hit a button to go to the next page and feel comfortable about what I'm actually going to be doing. In this case, now I have to think about what photos aren't going to be great. And if you look at a, you know 50 photos you take, there's probably half of them suck. But in the case of Coop, you're not going to really think about it. You're going to think about the price and what you're purchasing. Here, you want to get the best deal, so you're going to edit every one of those photos out. So good lesson there. Don't overthink the problem and make it easy for people to get through your system. So, Trapid Beta customers. This is a uh, account. This is a, a customer of ours where we've helped them basically go from scratch to um, a full, full site. Customer engagement when you're first starting a site is very, very important. Right. So, one of the things that we did early on was to engage the customers and try and figure out how you get people into the system. So, we put a beta access there to request access and, and give people a chance to get into the site. Uh, we also played around with, with, with getting rid of the beta um, form just to see what would happen to the site. So how much did removing the beta form off the homepage affect sign-up? How many people think it, it decreased beta sign-ups by 50%? How many think it was out over 100%? Anyone think it actually improved the beta sign-ups? Come on, be daring. Oh, man, you gotta, you got to go for that one. It increased beta signups by 350% by actually taking off the beta form signup. Right? And what's the reason for that? Because we put the content in front of the signup. We gave people a reason to want to be part of the site by giving the content up and putting it in the front before actually requesting a beta signup. The beta signup actually happens two steps down past the home page. So by actually presenting what your value is up front, it encouraged people to actually sign up for the beta. So if you're trying to actually think about how you're getting people invested in a new service and you're trying to get their info, don't beat them over the head with it. Give them something of value before you actually try and ask them for that. The other part of this site is Trap actually collects uh, aggregated content for you into channels so that you can actually you know, read stuff that's interesting to you. Um, so what those were called were traps. You, you put together a trap and it would aggregate all the content around what you're actually doing. Uh, or want to read. So in this case, if we look at it, uh, here's an example of, of the chapter form. We put another form up here, tried this one out and said, hey, what if you uh, put in your, your uh, information here and we'd uh, collect it for you and give you a customized layout of the page with, with content. We also tried one where uh, we skipped that form, right? So did in traps decrease by removing the trap form? Anyone want to play this one? We just learned something there on the last slide. Anyone? All right. Page B uh, increased the traps from two to seven per user. So by removing the request form to create a trap, we actually improve the performance of the site in the traps. The trap is the engagement. So if you look at it, it's the power of suggestion. We basically presented uh, topics and, uh, around uh, content you might find interesting but wasn't necessarily targeted. 
And people found that more comfortable because they could click in and see what it was all about before actually trying to set up a trap. The trap was actually uh, encouraged later, like two clicks down. OK, so again, we have three concepts that we need to remember here. The first one is visual design, right? Visual design is very important to setting context. It's not the only thing. You can look at this and get an idea of maybe what this is all about, but you have no idea what it is until you actually add the content. The content is an important part of any uh, conversion activity. Now, if I separate the visuals and put the content in there and you think about the visuals, you can start to see what this actually potentially is. Right? It's not until you add the form elements to something that it really, really pulls this together it gives you a sense that this is a button that I might actually be able to follow uh, someone. In that case, you can follow us at Zurb. Uh, we actually present a lot of these ideas and concepts on our blog. Uh, we'll uh, put links on, on Twitter to our blog posts about these topics. Thanks. <laughs>